Welcome to the Republican Professor this afternoon. We have a very special guest, Dr. Perry Glanzer from Baylor University. Thank you for being here, Perry. I'm glad to be here. Perry, uh, you've done a lot of work for the School of Education there at Baylor, and you're an editor of the Christian Scholars Review. Is that correct? That's correct. Oh, yes, I've read that. I've read it many times. So you have this training in ethics as well. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, my PhD is actually in ethics, even though I'm in a school of education. Oh, okay. Where did you do your PhD? Uh, University of Southern California. Ah, uh, yes. Did you happen to know a man named Dallas Willard? There? Yeah, he was on my committee. And so I, I took quite a few courses from Dallas. How cool is that? <laughs> He's a tremendous man and a tremendous thinker. Wow, I'm so jealous. Um, what year did you graduate? I'm uh, sorry, I don't want to date you, but. Oh, that's fine. Yes. 1998 is when I completed the okay. PhD. I took courses earlier in the 90s. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can date me. All right, so that would have been after Scott Ray was there. Yeah, actually Scott, Scott. Scott, there's one, Scott Ray is one of the reasons I ended up at USC. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah, I ended up talking to him. and. Uh, he, I was looking at other places, and he says you, I should check out USC, and so I ended up uh, applying there and, and going there. So you can blame Scott Ray for it all. I, guess. I do. I blame him. I'm going to put that in the notes. In fact, that's going to be the the title. We blame Scott Ray. Yeah. yeah he'll laugh at that. I know Scott. Well, uh, what was Dallas Willard like? You no, know, it's. I mean, Dallas is not. Uh, a fan, you know, he is a humble man, but a brilliant man and uh, very thoughtful and uh, insightful and, and yes, you know, treats students well. Uh, you know, one of the stories that circulated around there was that they made him chair because the philosophy department, everybody's having such a hard time getting along. That's the reason why they made Dallas chair is they needed somebody who could help things out there. That was a story I heard anyway. Philosophers fight with each other? What? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. What kind of courses did you take from him? Um, ethics, a uh, course on postmodernism and uh, something else on epistemology. Wow. Postmodernism. What was the second thing you said? Ethics. Social ethics and epistemology. Yeah. So actually, I, there, there's yeah, like the last one I just took for uh, grins. I, I didn't take it for credit because I just wanted to uh, take a course from Dallas. That's pretty substantive stuff. Um, what did you do your dissertation on? Well, actually, it was something different. I uh, I did my dissertation under a professor named Don Miller there in the religion department, and uh, I did it on something called the commission. Uh, after the fall of communism, all these uh, you know, the communists had a well-developed system of moral education, and they realized that they needed a replacement. And what happened was, uh, through some Western sort of mission agencies, a number of them were exposed to something called the Jesus film, and they wanted more of it, and they wanted more, they wanted this Christian replacement for ethics. And so they invited, you know, hundreds of Westerners over affiliated with a whole variety of Christian mission groups to train their teachers and to teach uh, Christian ethics in after-school classes. And it was a fabulous thing to study because it brought in you know, just so many issues with which I was interested. Um, and perhaps one of the most fascinating findings, you know, I'll just summarize my dissertation in a couple sentences here, but you know, one of the most fascinating findings is when I asked, uh, you know, I interviewed over hundred Russian and Ukrainian uh, teachers, you know, what's the difference you find, the most striking difference you find between Christian ethics and communist ethics is they said communist ethics did not teach us to forgive and i've learned to forgive through christian ethics which i think is quite profound wow that's that's pretty deep communism did not teach us to forgive no and uh, so there's obviously evil in communism because otherwise what would there be to forgive right it's interesting how well, they would think about evil what's evil yeah certainly uh i mean you know reading the history of russia you encounter lots of evil 
but also even in my yeah. interviews, I encountered lots of evil where uh, people had relatives disappear or had fishing accidents and they were never found, things like that. Um, it was a tough thing, you know, and it's, it's really tough for those teachers because they spent a lot of them, you know, elementary school teachers, for example, they would teach these stories about how Lenin and Stalin were such great men and that how you should imitate uh, Lenin and Stalin. In fact, there's this old translated Soviet pedagogy textbook and it's entitled, I want to be like Stalin. And I mean, that's what they taught. And so then to find out, you know, Stalin is a mass murderer of hundreds of, you know, tens of millions. And, uh, you know, Lenin did, is not. Did they not know that? No, they did not. Oh, They did not know the truth. And even today, there's pretty heavy, there's kind of a revival of Stalinism in, in uh, Russia right now. Uh, yeah. because, I mean, there's just not, you know, it's hard to look at the bad things from your past. I mean, Americans find the same thing. Uh, and it's kind of funny, you know, we kind of talk about, we had these stories about George Washington and chopping down the cherry tree, and they had their stories about Lennon being such a good boy and helping the neighbors next door with their schoolwork after he came home from a hard day of school. So sometimes you got to be careful about your national, using nationalistic myths to promote virtue. Yeah, that's a, there's a lot there. My, yeah. my grandfather was involved with that Jesus film thing in Ukraine. He went over there okay. and actually I think he went to Russia as well to uh, be a part of that. Uh, he talked a lot about that. I was, um, I'm not really sure the details of the, the effort, but I, I'm familiar with the general concept of now that communism is gone, what do we replace it with? And I thought, okay, so this is an interesting effort to use a film to <laughs> replace a system of ethics in a, an entire civilization. I don't, I don't think that that's yeah. Well, I uh, think enough the that, film that inspired it. What ended up happening is they end up uh, the Jesus Film Project ended up turning. Uh, they spawned off a group called the International School Project, which is still active today, and they ended up uh, writing curriculum for school children to help teach them Christian ethics. And so they, they do that around the world now and, you know, are quite successful in areas that are hungry for offering children something positive. And, and honestly, they were fairly successful in Russia and Ukraine in certain pockets. You know, the problem is, uh, is that, you know, it's the system, when the larger systems corrupt, it's hard for those individual teachers to make a tremendous difference. And so there needs to be some systematic reform. You mentioned Stalinism. How do you define Stalinism? Well, I mean, I would say Lenin, both Leninism and Stalinism were in some ways uh, turning a certain kind of ideology into a really a, a kind of religious system. Um, for example, you know, Lenin, they, Lenin was the, you know, in Russian Orthodoxy, icons are, are a major thing. But what the communists did, they just created new icons and they made everyone wear little pictures of Lenin. All the school children had to do that. They had pictures of Lenin up all in the classroom. They had statues of Lenin and Stalin, of course, everywhere. They just created a new iconography uh, to replace the old religious iconography. In fact, one of the one uh, student I interviewed, she talked about she was Seventh Day Adventist, how she got persecuted heavily because she's a Seventh Day Adventist and wouldn't wear you know a Lenin icon uh, that the young students are supposed to wear your teacher would call her out and say bad things about her wow so that, that's uh yeah there's a book uh i can't i'm forgetting the author right now talking about harvard press book kind of talking about the sort of this cult of lenin and stalin and how it became a substitute religion okay i'll look for that harvard press book on that that's interesting i'm fascinated by communism I've been fascinated since I was a little kid about it. Uh, they always freaked me out, <laughs> the communists. But well, there, a, there's probably for good reason. I mean, if you really, if you go visit the countries and you see the, the effects, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, part of my uh, personal story is, you know, you're in the ivory tower learning all about ethics. But then when you go see the consequences idea, of ideas, you know, there's the famous book, Ideas Have Consequences. Um, doing the going to do research in post-Soviet Union was probably one of the best ways to get over my graduate school 
experience of sort of ivory towering all these ideas. Wow. Just saw the destruction to the families, the society, to uh, the social fabric in major ways. You know, for example, I actually went back to Russia then in 2001, you know, and I had, I was teaching ethics there and I had to teach a course on bribery, you know, because it's not something we teach here, but in Russia and every, everybody in the class had had to deal with bribery. So how do you deal with it? Um, It was one of the ethical challenges that they faced. That's interesting. I I had to teach that too. Uh, Actually, it comes up in, in, um, it came up in one of my courses that I taught. I taught in business departments for a long time, over a decade. Uh, And the book I used for business ethics and public policy because of the business majors doing um, business outside the United States, uh, one of the standard modules was, was the ethics of bribery. So it's interesting. So you had to, you had, did you have any experience with bribery when you were over there? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, anytime you interact with a public official, there's an expectation of uh, cutting out, I mean, a gift mm-hmm. um, as well. And also too, uh, the institutions at which I did research, I did research on, there's a, a small number of, of Christian institutions that emerged after post-communism. And for example, one was a Seventh-day Adventist institution about an hour outside of Moscow. And, you know, the mafia works different in Russia in that, you know, in the United States, maybe they're involved, organized crimes involved in pornography or strip clubs and gambling, things like this. But in Russia, organized crime is involved in everything. And even they come with an, and would request protection money, which they call Krishna Roof, uh, from, you know, this Christian Adventist college an hour outside of Moscow. And uh, they discussed how they had to deal with it. They actually saw it as, uh, it was interesting, the story they told me was the day the person was supposed to come, this person who was threatening them, uh, he didn't show up. And later they found out he had an accident and died. So they, they interpreted that providentially. Wow. I, I have a little bit of experience. Again, I'm bringing up my grandpa. Wow. Well, um, he uh, did missions work in Mexico for a while and it was, uh, they didn't have a lot of experience with bribery, but they did have some uh, really disturbing encounters that they uh, told me about where they would get pulled over. They'd have gifts for the children. They worked with orphans. They, they would have uh, Christmas gifts um, that they're bringing down and get pulled over by the police. And um, unfortunately, my my uh, grandfather's wife knew the attorney general of Mexico. And so they became quite frightened, actually, at that point of of them at that point. But but she uh, she shamed them for taking stuff out of Mexican kids hands. Uh, Anyway, and it and we don't have to deal with that to the same extent or in same ways here in the United States. Would you say that's fair to say? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, th- I think that's one of the things too, that is helpful. I think traveling is always helpful. C.S. Lewis talked about, you know, history is one of those ways you can make sure avoid the errors of your local village and uh, travel is one of those ways too. And I think uh, it's helpful for people to go to travel and realize that, you know, like I saw a tweet recently, it says, you know, human, United States was the major human rights violator of, you know, this past century. I thought, wow, they just don't understand most of world, I mean, a lot of world history and lots of other countries. Um, and I think it helps to yeah. just study those other countries and go to visit and see the results. I know there's corruption here, but it's it just takes a different, it seems like it takes a different form if it's here. Um, like, for example, I don't feel any fear i think i'm reasonable in believing i don't have any fear i live in southern california orange county if i were driving my uh, presence for kids or homeless people here we run a homeless ministry here our church does um and i i don't have any fear of being pulled over by the california highway patrol and being asked for a bribe i don't have any fear about being pulled over by orange county deputy and being asked for a bribe or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, police. Yeah. I like to tell my students that uh, 
you know, every, just like every family, every, every country has fallen and they're, they're fallen in different ways. And there's some you'd rather live in than others. And, uh, you know, America's- what, what, what is that? What, why, why would we rather live in some than others? That's, that's a puzzling thing. If you take a Christian view of the world, we're all fallen. We're all, sh- we're all sinful. We all fall short of the glory of God, according to the scriptures. Um, why is it that there would be some places that are, are, um, they seem to be going through periods of darker time than others. Is that just the way things work out or is there another, is there something else going on? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, just think about fathers and father's day recently, right? The highest, the major factor that's going to determine whether you end up in prison is not your income or even your race. It's whether you're fatherless. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, family structure. I mean, some of those things are family structures and of course the character and virtue, the people in those families. And I think the same is true with uh, countries, you know, whether it's respect for rule of law and the particular kinds of, you know, laws it created uh, or whether the structure is stable or if it's um, fragmented and, uh, you know, partly deteriorating. How long did you spend in uh, the Soviet Union or Russia? I can't remember. I, th- I thought you said the Soviet Union. But it was uh, with former, I called it former Soviet Union. I spent uh, kind of my dissertation research. I spent about eight months in, in Russia and Ukraine. And then uh, I also taught in, in Moscow for a year in 2011. I mean, I'm sorry, 2001. What uh, place did you teach in Moscow? I taught at two places. One is a, called Druzhby It's uh, just a ru- secular Russian university. It's really an interesting university that a lot of students go there, but a lot of international students that we wouldn't get here, like students from Cuba, Angola, um, Vietnam, uh, China, you know, more Russian, Iraq, Iran, and, and more Russian friendly kind of places. What so was the have, name? What was the name of the school again? I'm sorry. Uh, Druzhby Narodov. It's called. It's uh, in English. It's called the People's Friendship University. Do you did? Were you speaking Russian in the classroom? No, well, uh, some, but I mean, I was conversational, but I'm not fluent, and so. Uh, okay. I would... Sounded sounded pretty legit to me just then. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's been 20 years. But yeah, it was, it was quite fascinating. Uh, I was reading. I was teaching social philosophy. Wow. And um, yeah, the Russian state, you know, when 9 11 happened. Mm. Um, so we had a lot to talk about. Oh, wow. Uh, what was the other place that you, you said two? There's two places? Yeah, I taught at a burgeoning Christian uh, university. I just started a liberal arts Christian university called Russian American Christian University. And that was when things were going well. And they invited Americans to kind of start one of these model institutions. Uh, however, the, uh, they eventually shut it down. Oh. Shut down. What did you teach there? Um, I taught ethics. Cool. Yeah. Wow, what a great Actually, experience! I also, I, I also I taught American history. <laughs> no kidding. Which, uh, how were how were your students there? Were they good? Uh, you know, they were uh, they're okay. They're good. I mean, uh, there is a reason. I mean, there's a lot of cheating in the former Soviet Union. In fact, it's one of the most notorious places for you know them in Nigeria, India. Ukraine and Russia are known for academic cheating. That was even true at the Christian University. I mean, it's just part of the the culture. You mean they're passing notes around in class, or you you mean they're attributing... uh, doing you know any any way that you cheat? I mean, just passing each other's work around, cheating off each other, looking. You know, okay. Interesting. Uh, but I mean, sometimes it gets even more. Like there's, there's there's literature about the bribery situation. You know, that professors are bribed with vodka candy flowers cash or sexual favors <laughs> i went i was uh i gave an exam at a community college here in california i'm not kidding i'm not kidding the the guy brought in a, a 12 pack of michelope yeah and he he thought that was gonna do it <laughs> i you know some of my students i just you know <laughs> well anyway um all right well uh so you have this wonderful academic background, uh, PhD with Dallas Willard. He's so, he's like a rock star here. He's like Van Halen, you know, 
if, if Dallas Willard's walking on stage, it's it's a big deal here. Of course, it would be even a bigger deal now because he's not alive. <laughs> it would be resurrected. But um, you have, uh, do, how did you get interested in ethics? Where did you grow up and where did you first get the idea to study what you're studying? Yeah, I, uh, it's funny. I, you know, I'm, I'm a, Christianity obviously is a serious deal for me. And I was true even in high school, but the odd thing is I made my choice of what I was going to do without even a hint of a Christian mind whatsoever. I was in the counseling office and I knew I was decent in math and science and I looked at what would get make a lot of money and what would, you know, had a lot of jobs available. And so I thought I'd major in engineering. Um, right. I mean, I, I made the decision like a pagan, I would say. And it's kind of intriguing to me that you know, I had that bifurcation, even though I mean I thought Christianly about lots of other parts of my life, which perhaps goes to say something about how the culture can corrupt us. Um, I went to Rice University, but I immediately realized that I went into engineering for the wrong reasons. And, you know, you have to, to persist through engineering. You have to have to love it and do it for the right reasons. Um, so I ended up uh, majoring in history, political science, and religion. Uh, Rice kind of allows a certain a large amount of experimentation and uh, even, you know, double, triple majoring like that. And through the, a lot of those classes, I really became interested in the history of ethics. Uh, just it was a fascinating intersection, I would say, of those three kinds of disciplines. I ended up going to get a master's in church state at Baylor just because it was, a, it was an interdisciplinary master's degree that really focused on those kinds of questions. And then I pursued a, an ethics PhD. Um, so, yeah, that was, that's a bit of the journey there. Wow, that's awesome. So mainly in Texas, and then you go from Texas to Southern California. Was that a, a little bit of a culture shock for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, SoCal in particular uh, it seems pretty image-oriented, I would say. Uh, externalities are important. And that had, it's funny. I had never really bothered, you know, the type of car I drove never really bothered me. And then all of a sudden I get in Southern California, and it's funny, you kind of feel the the, you know, what the red, red hot chili peppers call Californication, right? Uh, it's, um, you can feel it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually ran into the red hot chili peppers singer. Uh, I forget his name, but I mainly, I, I mainly knew him, knew of him from, um, his role in Point Break, where he beats up Keanu Reeves, <laughs> if you know that film. But yeah, uh, I did. I seen that yeah. and uh, Gary Busey comes and try and saves him. Actually, no, no, sorry, it's uh, Patrick Swayze that comes and saves him. But uh, in Malibu, I ran into, we ran into him. Uh, I was teaching a class. I was teaching at Pepperdine. I taught at Pepperdine for over a mm -hmm. decade, and um, uh, it was funny. He's just there at Starbucks hanging out. Uh, ran, ran into quite a few celebrities there. So, uh, Christy, not Christy Brinkley. Um, who's the other one? Can't remember her name. Famous model. She actually ran and ran right into me with her dog in her purse. Like the dog's face got crushed. Anyway, uh, what was her name? Uh, shoot. I'm going to have to, she's, she's kind of like uh, new people wouldn't know her. She's like mainly an eighties kind of a model, but, uh, well, that's like it'll, her. it'll come to, it'll come to me. It's, I have her, I have her in mind. I think she was married to Richard Gere or she dated Richard. Gere. I don't know my popular culture. I apologize. I'm dropping the ball here. I'm such a bad California person because I don't know names. I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you an, an, I'll give you a story. You might be able to appreciate this. So I, I'm teaching at Loyola Marymount in the, in Los Angeles. This is um, few, several years ago now. And I make a little jokes with my students, little goofy jokes to try to learn their names. Like, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll have them uh, come up, bring their quizzes up to me and that I, I take role and they bring their quizzes up to me and that's how I learn their names. So if the a girl's name is, was Whitney something, I might ask, is there any relation to Whitney Houston? And, you know, she thinks it's a dumb joke, but it helps me remember her name. And, and she says, that doesn't even make any sense. It's a first name. Well, so I have this guy named Michael Jackson, 
in the class. He's this white guy. He's wearing camo. He looks like he's from Texas to me. Uh, looks like he likes guns, you know, and I just said to this guy, John Neville, I said, any relation to Neville Chamberlain? And he said, who's Neville Chamberlain? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, so I, this guy, Michael Jackson, I, so I said, why don't you moonwalk that quiz up to me? You know, you know, stuff like that. You know, where's your shiny glove? Innocuous stuff. About halfway through the semester, a student comes in to my office hours and says, you know that that's Michael Jackson's son, right? And I said, what? So I Googled in my office there, same face, that, that kid in my class is Michael. So oh, wow. the, whole time I, the whole time I was thinking, what, what Jackson family has a kid and says, you know, let's name him Michael. What the heck? You know, because when I was a kid, Michael Jackson was the most famous person in the world besides like Ronald Reagan and you know, right. maybe Margaret Thatcher or something. But but uh you know the pepsi commercials and stuff well anyway this kid was so it didn't bother him at all hmm. he, he laughed at all my jokes he came into my office hours and it turned out that he knew that i didn't know and everybody kind of knew that i just had no idea and i was just a goofball and so it was kind of a running joke in the class and everybody was kind of laughing at me actually because I didn't do the jokes very, very much past the, like the third week. Cause once I knew their names, I, you know, I just kind of went, it was business, all business, but, but anyway, yeah. So, and then, you know, he would, he would come find me in uh, later semesters, but <laughs> turns out the Jackson family I had in my mind was Michael Jackson, <laughs> that, <laughs> that Jackson, they, they're, they're the ones that decided to name him Michael. Anyway, I'll just share that story because I think it's funny. I have a couple of other stories that are but I don't know names. I don't know any, I'm a, I'm a total idiot as far as uh, popular culture goes, but yeah, it, it, Cal, Southern California is quite a, quite a trip in, in many respects. Of course, USC is, is in kind of a rough neighborhood though, right? In Los Angeles. Yeah, I was it's not, I was in, it's not Malibu. I was in SoCal for all the exciting things for Rodney King riots. In fact, one of the, I was just driving back from uh, one of the, one of my classes when I turned on the TV when I got home and realized the intersection I drove through was all in flames. And then I was also there there for the Northridge earthquake and yeah, I did get kind of jumped too by USC as well. So what was that like? I mean, did were you affected by the riots? Um, yeah, I ended up actually doing research on the African the response of African American churches to the riots. And wow. it was really quite uh, fascinating, inspiring research on what was interesting to me is that, you know, some of the more powerful kind of mainline Protestant African-American churches did not seem to do as much. And what we found is really a lot of the more smaller evangelical uh, African-American churches were the ones really uh, making a difference in, tr in terms of how they're reaching out and trying to change things. You mean you did empirical it, survey research, like qualitative research? Uh, yeah, I did the part. This was actually with a couple of USC professors, Don Miller and John Orr. They were the ones who sort of wrote up the results. Um, oh. And um, I, I, I wasn't here for that. I, I moved here and I moved to California in 1993 originally. So I, I missed that. I missed the, the Northridge earthquake as well. Although I taught at Cal State Northridge and I heard stories. I yeah. taught at Cal State Northridge for several years. Uh, were you affected by that earthquake? You know, not as much. Okay. <laughs> Although I will say probably emotionally, it was like, you know, it used to be I laugh at earthquakes because they just seem, you know, minor. But after that Northridge quake, I didn't laugh as much. Although well, my roommate could... did sleep through it at the time. So. You... Uh have tornadoes in texas have you ever experienced one of those not uh if in close range no okay which is fortunate although yeah. waco where i live is certainly one of the more actually i think it was the most powerful tornado up at that time in north america it was the waco quake i mean not quake uh tornado in the 1950s 
I don't even live in Texas, and I had a uh, had a tornado go right over me when I was uh, in Bass Pro Shop in Dallas. The hmm. one, um, well, it's actually Rowlett, if you know Dallas area. But yeah, that was a, several years ago. Went right over us and killed killed several people. Hmm. And I would have been on that road had had I left Bass Pro Shop uh, five minutes before. Uh, oh, wow. there, there was an overpass and the, the cars were swept off the overpass it's really sad to to drive by that on the way back that was christmas of uh christmas of uh, i forget the the, the date hmm. the time oh, it's really but, unusual like tornadoes in december yeah it was very unusual yeah it was really odd um now how did you uh come to teach in the school of education as an ethicist, um, I don't know much about schools of education. Do you train for the certification process for no, public I, school? Or? This is kind of an odd, it's an odd story in that um, I ended up meeting uh, somebody working in a provost office in, at a conference, academic conference in England uh, while I was in, teaching in Russia. And he was from Baylor. His name is David Lyle Jeffrey. He's a kind of well-known uh, literature professor. Oh, and, yes. I know that name. I have one of his books. I have the big dictionary of biblical tradition and English literature. Right. Well, we were at a meeting at a conference about this Oxford professor. It was just a small group of us. And we got to talking, and he asked me to send the CV, but I actually wasn't anticipating coming back to the United States. However, we ended up having some health difficulties with our young, our, who's our oldest son, actually, but uh, our young son at the time. And so we ended up needing to come back and we were in contact and I came back to Baylor and interviewed in three different departments and ended up, uh, uh, they hired me in the School of Education because they were starting sort of a great books, teaching great books in education at that time. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. Great yeah. books. I'm all for that. Um, so what kind of research are you involved with? I know that you have a blog and you're interested yeah, in I, integrating right now, faith and learning. Right now I do uh, research on uh, Christian higher education and moral education in higher education. And so, for example, I just recently received a grant from the Templeton Foundation to study uh, virtue development in uh, certain kinds of contexts both within Christian universities and within the secular university context. That sounds very interesting. When, for people who are listening that maybe don't know about what you mean by virtue, what, would you give some examples of that and how yeah, that might I mean, go? Sure. You know, classically, they're sort of known as uh, seven virtues, usually three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, but then sort of four classical virtues that Aristotle taught, you know, justice, uh, wisdom, temperance, courage. Uh, sometimes temperance is understood as self-control. And one of the more intriguing uh, academic developments that has happened in the past about uh, two and a half to three decades is the development of what's called positive psychology, which has, instead of trying to figure out what's wrong with people, it actually tries to figure out, well, what helps people flourish? And what, what helps their well-being? And virtues or, or character strengths are considered central to this study. We're gonna, so there's, in the past two and a half decades, there's been, you know, philosophers and theologians have always written about the virtues, but social scientists have really not paid them close attention until about the past two and a half decades. And it's really an exciting time uh, in psychology for that reason, and also some of the interdisciplinary conversations that are happening. Um, so, the idea is that a college, whether it's Christian or whether it's uh, run by the state, would have a legitimate role in inculcating these kind of virtues, justice, temperance, courage. What was the fourth one again? Uh, wisdom. Wisdom. Well, actually, I mean, yeah, if you study the history of higher, you know, higher education, when the university started, everybody talked about the work for the development of wisdom. It's pretty much taken for granted. Of course, they were heavily influenced by the Catholic uh, thought at the time in the Middle Ages, you know, when the University of Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge originated. 
Um, it's only actually in the past century that the idea that the university doesn't uh, help produce uh, people with virtue, it's only in the past century that that idea developed. It was really, it's really an odd and young idea. And now it's coming back. Now, part of the reason why that idea developed is uh, the secularization of the university, right? If you don't agree on a uh, certain kind of uh, narrative, a Christian narrative, a Christian metaphysical view, well, how do you agree on virtue, what virtues you teach? And that's been one of the struggles uh, of particularly more uh, secular universities. But the reality is every virtue teaches, uh, I mean, every university teaches virtue. Uh, they all encourage intellectual honesty. They all uh, encourage some kind of self-control, you know, when it comes to, say, your professional development, things like that. Um, the question is just uh, how extensive are they really in their encouragement of virtue? Do they just encourage virtue, for example, in your profession, like, you know, making sure you are a just business person or a compassionate social worker? Or do they also encourage and help you develop virtues in other areas of your life. And for the most part, universities have shrunk away from that in the past century. In fact, my recent book, The Dismantling of Moral Education, is, a, is the story of that, is the, basically tells that story of how uh, universities dismantle their visions for moral education, largely because they have a very reductive view of education. So it's been reduced to what exactly? Making money, having some kind of credential to impress somebody? Um, I would say, I'd probably interpret it, I mean, on the sympathetic side of, they still encourage you to be an excellent professional and they still encourage you to be an excellent citizen. And so they, they really focus on those kinds of virtues. Uh, for example, you know, like I said, what does it mean to be, you know, show certain, you know, we're going to teach you how to be a, you know, an excellent nurse, and that's going to involve self-control and wisdom and showing justice. We're going to, and this is why you really actually see the really focus on social justice these days, is because it's really one of the few identities the university really tries to engage in moral formation, trying to help you be a good professional and trying to help you be a good citizen. And that's why they just focus on, the, whereas the reality is like a, a more robust view, in fact, older forms of virtue education in the university focus on a whole range of virtues. Um, you know, not just the seven I mentioned, but you know, they focus on forgiveness, humility. Um, they would focus on generosity, gratitude. Um, you know, you could go on and on listing virtues, accountability. But because we only focus on, a, on perfecting a couple parts of the human identity now in most state universities, I wouldn't say perfecting, but just, you know, it's probably not a bad word, but trying to cultivate excellence in those cup two identities. Like there's, there's hardly a university that offers a course on what does it mean to be an excellent spouse or a husband or wife? What does it mean to be an excellent friend? You know, there's not hardly a university. I mean, you may read a little Aristotle on friendship or something, but um, there's just all these other identities. What does it mean to be a you know, steward of your finances? Now, there's personal finance courses, but they don't really talk about it in terms of virtue that much. Uh, they don't talk about it in terms of gratitude and stewardship and uh, yeah, those sort of char charity, that kind of thing. For the secular person, the secular student, the secular college, all that sounds awesome, what you're talking about. Just the very brief picture you provided there about this could appeal to finances, personal finances, business, um, not to mention, um, well, I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is, is the selling point to that, try to bring that back to say, you'll be happier, we'll, we'll make a happier citizen or a happier student or uh, is it because in linking it with flourishing and positive psychology or is, is that, there something fundamental missing from the secular uh, structure that prevents this full orbed um thing from coming back i guess like how do you have justice yeah. 
How do you have social justice without wisdom? Well, I don't know, I, I don't thing, know how you do that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the thing that is really lacking is a view of what is the ideal self or who are we? I would say uh, secular universities have a hard time answering who are we? And this is why a Christian university, for example, has an easier time in the sense of if you say we are fundamentally, we are humans made in the image of God. And so you achieve human flourishing when you bear God's virtues, when you imitate God, you know, or you imitate Christ. So for a Christ, Christian university, you can point to that. And that actually, so that vision, that fundamental understanding that influences, okay, how do we deal with race relations? How do we deal with gender issues? How do we deal with uh, friendship? How do we deal with uh, um, family relationships? Well, if you start with that, we're all made in the image of God, you flourish by bearing God's virtues, then that transforms all those other areas. But if you only focus on one little part of the human life, like what does it mean to be a good citizen? And that's all you focus on. And you only focus on the virtue, of, especially of justice, which is really focused on in citizenship, then it really distorts everything else. And everything else becomes distorted and you avoid and, you know, there's breakdown. You know, we have a fatherless crisis right now in the United States. We have the highest rate of sin. Uh, we have the highest rate of uh, children living with a single parent of any place in the world. Now, I should note that in Africa, for example, they'll, they have a fatherless crisis too, but it's different because a lot of other relatives come in and live with the children. And so the fatherless crisis is different. But... Um, yeah, so we have some major problems, but you know, the university doesn't give as much attention to that because they aren't going to focus on, okay, what does it mean to be an excellent father? Because so they're so focused on being an excellent professional, being an excellent citizen. And that's kind of the contemporary university right now. Yeah, that's insightful. Um, the issue of uh, white supremacy, I hear that. I hear. I hear structural racism thrown around a lot. See, it seems like a lot of the focus that, that many have is on who has power yeah. instead of stewardship. A stewardship approach would, would be, well, everybody's got some power and right. what are we doing with it? Right. Um, maybe instead of, trying to take power away because then that, that's an adversarial thing right focusing on uh developing people who use whatever power they have to uh, steward that um but of course there'd have to be some goal or some end it'd have to right. be a teleological framework and i think that's kind of what you're identifying is it's really hard to to try to fit that into a secular milieu where it seems like people are running around with their heads cut off. A lot yeah. of people don't even believe that fathers are necessary or that right. there's such a real thing as being a father. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. I think you know, that is one of the core problems. I'll, sh I'll share an example where it was done in the past, kind of in a little more secular context. Like there used to be this view of, University does teach you what it means to be an excellent woman or man. And that was in the 1900s. And it kind of replaced Christianity way, right? Because there's a sense in which, as the university was they said, we need some moral ideal. And so they got this moral ideal of what does it mean to be a gentleman or a lady? And these were like gender terms that had moral, some moral substance to them. The problem was they got associated with manners too much, right? I mean, like, oh, yeah, it's all about manners. But the core, I think one of the concepts that you mentioned that they got right and would have been helpful, especially for men, is you have to steward your power as a man. I mean, 97% of rapes happen because of men. 92% of the people in jail are men. They have to steward power. And the ethic of the gentleman was helpful at that. And we need to revive. Um, and I think, you know, I think in terms of Christianity, obviously, the example of Christ becomes your you know there's a stewardship of power that's very different um, but yeah that's that's what the universities they try to do it some in the past but it's basically falling on its face right now 
That's really insightful. Would you call that the genteel tradition? Is yes. that what the people mean, mean by that? I see that term uh, when I read uh, George Santayana. I just yeah. picked him up and started reading him one time. Yeah, uh, he, no, he lived during I mean, it has its pluses and minuses. John Henry Newman has this great line about, you know, the gentleman kind of just gets at the surface oftentimes. I mean, the kind of the genteel tradition, that ethic it often helped the surface, it didn't get at the core. And I think Newman was right on that. And Christians want more than good manners. Um, but, you know, it does, it did hit something. I mean, C.S. Lewis has this great line about, you know, I'd rather my, I'd rather play cards with, with um, somebody who is bred to believe a gentleman does not cheat than, you know, somebody who grew up among card sharp, sharpers or cheaters. I mean, basically, you know, that, that the habitus, the habits that were, formed that way can't help yeah and of course we're not just talking about card games we're talking about doing business we're talking right. about yes. um people sitting on the city council uh, right. you know or being a jury juror in a, in a lot of folks that I, a lot of my students are really concerned about the criminal justice system and i just tell them the story of when i was a juror on a murder trial in compton uh this is a long time ago when i was in seminary it was a three-week trial and um what i noticed was i was the only person on the jury that had any formal training in logic mm -hmm. um and i'm surprised that didn't keep me off the jury actually because i was a ta and that, when they asked me what i did i said that's what my job was i was a ta for for David Chalky at Biola University, for his, he taught the logic course there. He still does. And uh, now they have common sense, um, yeah. but there were some standard fallacies that I noticed that were occurring over and over again. And I took good notes, and not to mention just taking notes, you know, having an attention span. Um, a lot of people don't take notes. They, they just try to remember everything and, and well, look, this person's life is in your hands. And, yeah. and then a lot of people try to get out of jury duty, you know? So, I mean, when I think of the criminal justice system, you know, and the system, the quote unquote systemic issues, uh, the first thing I think of is my personal experience sitting on a jury. I mean, sitting there. And I'm watching what other jurors are doing. I'm, I'm, I'm in the deliberation room. I hear what they're missing or, 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 or maybe what they're focusing on, which is a red herring. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of teaching critical thinking, but I think, and, and logic uh, and requiring it. But what I hear from you is that's just part of the picture that that might be go, that might go to maybe wisdom yeah, um to this. although and, i probably and, ju I, and justice because because yeah, you know if you can't think those. critically and you're making a decision about somebody's life that's directly yeah so that's so do you have hope that um that the university can become better um secular well, or christian yeah that's a great question um i would say Speaking i have hope you're the one that brought up hope <laughs> yeah well i would say what's interesting is we actually were looking for scales that measure hope and what you find is while christians can agree a lot with secularists on what self-control looks like i mean really most of the scales we wouldn't have a lot of difference when it comes to hope there's tremendous differences uh, a lot of times for secularists, hope is more sort of optimism or just, uh, you know, you're, you kind of have an optimistic personality, whereas Christian hope is more centered on a, it has to be rightly directed towards God. And that's, I would say that's where the hope is. Although I, I'll also say this, I, I've studied Christian higher education for the whole world. I have a list of all the Christian universities in the world. And there are some exciting things happening around the world uh, among Christian universities. Africa has the highest number of Christian universities started in the past two decades. More Christian universities started there than all the rest of the world combined. Uh, and so there's great things happening with Africa. And South Korea 
has seen tremendous growth in the number of Christian universities. Australia, interestingly enough, very secular country, in fact, is the only continent on which the university, the first university was secular. Only continent like that. Uh, they did not have a Christian university until 30 years ago, but now there are eight Christian universities. In fact, uh, I, I just visited them all. I was just visiting them, uh, them all this past March. And uh, the Catholic Australian Catholic University there is the largest English-speaking Catholic university in the world, as what the father told me, and I believe him, because, I mean, he gave me the numbers, and I have the numbers. So there's some, uh, there are some great things happening, uh, especially among faith-based institutions around the world. Do I have hope for a lot of secular universities? Um, not so much. I think they'll still do good things. I think they'll still produce good engineers, um, people who are kind of good, you know, they're concerned about citizenship. I, I think they'll still do that. But when it comes to kind of forming people for holistic, I mean, a flourishing human being, I'm not as hopeful there. Although I will say there's some good conversations on human flourishing that are happening now in academia. Um, but the reality is, like in Australia, in most of Europe, these places are pretty instrumental in how they view the university. Uh, the university is there to help you get a job and uh, train you in a profession and help you become a good citizen. Um, yeah, that's that's really insightful. How do you keep up with all those universities? How do you get, gather all those data? Well, I uh, have uh, my graduate students help me. It is one of the ways I did it. Uh, but also too, you know, it's, it's funny when you just spend, uh, spend a little time here and there, um, you can, you can uh, find any you know, websites with the World Wide Web, you can find out a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. That, that makes me sad what you said about Australia, uh, just about getting a job. Um, I, I have a hard time understanding how even the concept of a university with that mentality of just getting a job, because to me, uh, you have, <laughs> what, what, why, why would you have a, a field of, uh, or a I mean, what kind of jobs are they? Are these that you're trying to get? You know, well, I mean, they're, they're you know advanced jobs. I'll say this: yeah. most people don't recognize how unusual the United States is. I mean, we talk about American exceptionalism mm -hmm. sometimes, and sometimes it's overblown. But when it comes to the university, it really, America really is exceptional in the sense that most universities around the world they don't require general general education or core curriculum. Um, they only require the courses within your major in your area of study. And so there's not this idea, and I would say it's really a Christian idea. And the reason why it started in the United States is because all the, almost all the universities, I mean, colleges in America started as Christian. They also started as private, most of them. In fact, we did not have a majority of students going to public universities in America until 1952. So most people went to private universities and most of them were residential. Uh, and most universities around the world are not residential. You know, in fact, the majority of the universities in Australia, students just commute to them, even some of the major ones, except for, except for Sydney and Melbourne and a couple others. Um, so if your university is not residential, it doesn't have core curriculum or general ed, um, it becomes very quite instrumental. Now what's neat is to see, and this is where I hope, right, is, these Christian universities they actually require three to four courses of general education for everybody. And most of them are theology, Bible, and philosophy uh, because they want everyone to know those things and think about those things. And that's true in Africa as well. Africa, those universities, a lot of them have started just to help with business or help people learn how to code and technology. But they've also started theology and philosophy departments or helping professions like in health uh, in fact, what's interesting, the uh, University of Notre Dame, Australia, has started two medical schools uh, in two different cities. Um, and so they're really, uh, they, yeah, there's some exciting things happening around the world. And Christianity, I think, is what helps uh, cultivate that kind of broader vision for the university. 
Where, where's the action in Africa? Is it in Uganda mainly, or where is it? Actually, it's all over, you know, sub-Saharan, but uh, it's, uh, I would say the two largest are Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, there, I have a, an edited volume I did with a couple of colleagues, Joel Carpenter and Nick Lantinga, uh, called Glo Christian Higher Education of Global Reconnaissance. And we have essays from uh, people from all over the world talking about Christian higher education in their country. And you'll find uh, two cha chapters there on, on Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, but that's not to say Angola, Tanzania, Mali. I mean, just uh, there's a variety of, not Mali, but I'm sorry, it's getting that confused enough. But uh, really most of the sub-Saharan, they've started Christian education, Christian universities, there, except for South Africa. South Africa, they used to have Christian universities, but after apartheid, they all secularized or got merged with secular institutions. So South Africa is the only country struggling. That's ironic. Yeah, it is that's, ironic. It's just odd. That's sad. Um, do you uh, do you mind if if I ask you about these universities in in Africa and stuff? Are are they requiring uh, ethics? Are they requiring logic? Are they requiring theology, Bible? They definitely are requiring Bible and theology. These uh, now it depends on the universities. The Catholic universities in Africa, you know, the Catholic tradition is usually require at least one philosophy course and one, but sometimes it's even more than that. Um, and so some of those African court, uh, universities are doing that are Catholic are doing that. The Protestant ones will be more heavy on uh, Christian ethics, the Bible, and theology. So they are doing that. Well, of course, it varies. Some of them are very small. I mean, these are, you know, 100, 200 students. But yet some of them, they've been started and associated with mega churches, And they are, you know, 10,000 students. So uh, there's, you know, it, it varies quite a bit. Uh, what's the financing uh, like in other schools, like in Africa? I know that we have a, a student loan program here, which underwrites most of it but what's what's it like over there you know interestingly enough most of the growth in christian higher education around the world is privately funded and it's also and privately controlled a part of that is because uh it allows for a lot of freedom and actually what happened in africa is there was such high demand for uh higher education it's something that scholars call massification just there's a tremendous growth in higher education throughout the world but they couldn't meet it. All the state institutions couldn't meet it. So Kenya, Nigeria, and all these countries, they used to prohibit private higher education, but now they don't. They got rid of those laws. So that's why you see this explosion in private higher education. It's true in Latin America too, although this actually happened earlier in Latin America in the 70s in particular and 80s, and it still continues. Uh, so a lot of it is privately funded. And that being said, there's some exceptions. For example, like in South Korea, I was on this campus, Baysock University, Beautiful new campus, uh, publicly funded. The state fund in South Korea funds all kinds of different uh, universities, secular, Christian, you know, other worldviews. Uh, same in Hungary. Hungary has a, a, a robust Catholic and Protestant university, and it's what they call principal plurals in there. They fund, uh, it's kind of like a, you know, in some ways like a voucher system in the sense that they fund all kinds of different kinds of universities. So India has the same thing. Indra, India, oddly enough, you know, a largely Hindu country, also funds Christian universities to a, certain, to a small degree. Wow. So there's certain exceptions like that. Australia, by the way, also funds um, those Christian universities. For example, yeah. I, Australian Catholic University is, public, is considered a public university. Notre Dame's a little different. Notre Dame of Australia and some of the other uh, Protestant institutions, they're funded a bit differently, but they still receive public funding. Um, often kind of through students and the majors they choose, but sometimes through some other means as well. Is there anything that these international universities can teach us in America? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I would say uh, some of the creativity uh, is there. Um, I would say one of the more inspiring places, and I hope it survives, that I've visited is called Ukrainian Catholic University. And I visited there in 2007 or 8, I can't remember exactly. But it was uh, doing some fantastic work. And what it was doing, it was building what uh, scholars call civil society. Those groups that are not the state or the family. 
And so what, you know, the communism had stamped all those out. But what was happening at Ukrainian Catholic University was they started a ministry to the prisons. They started a chaplaincy ministry. They started a ministry to uh, mentally and physically handicapped, actually at Arch ministry. You may be familiar with Henry now, and he actually taught there a year um, and was friends with the president uh, at the time. And uh, they also were starting other sorts of uh, just charities kind of things. And uh, some of the entrepreneurship was fantastic uh, that, that I saw there. there. There's other inspiring stories as well. But one of the things that they taught, taught that we may have to face here in the US and even Australia, I think has taught me this too, is uh, this is when uh, Ukraine, 2007, the election was just happening. And it was a pro-Russian person who won. They, and they want, went to protest to Kiev protest because the pro-Russian candidate won they fought for the election fraud and um, they shut down the university and went and protested well when they came back the Ukrainian version of the secret police was there and to threaten them and ask them to sign documents and they said they wouldn't sign them and they it was courageous now part, part of the reason is one of the professors there like for example he started Amnesty International in Ukraine he spent time in the gulag he says, they're not going to intimidate us. I mean, we've already done that. Um, and it was really inspiring. Now, the good news, of course, the story with Ukraine is actually they did overturn that pro-Russian candidate and the Ukrainian candidate did go into office. And of course, that's the reason why things are happening there today, uh, the way they are. But um, they stood up to intimidation. Uh, and I, even now in Australia, I would say the lesson might be a little different. They were very pragmatic, even though it's a very secular They've been able to create these institutions and survive and help them prosper, even in a generally hostile culture, I would say. It's a largely secular and pretty hostile. And they've, I think, probably finessed it better. You know, whereas Ukraine has been more, they were very much, were resisting strongly. But Australia, they pragmatically finessed. And I think in America, we may have to figure that out as we maybe move in a post-Christian culture. Each of these places is a different regulatory environment. Oh, yeah. So um, what do you think the major regulatory challenges are here in the United States for implementing some of these lessons that we could glean from these other places? Yeah, well, one. Or, I mean, or how would you the, couch that? Yeah, the good thing about America is we do not have a ministry of education that creates your accreditation process. I mean, that's the challenge, especially like these small- You're you know, saying that's a good thing? Yes, we don't have okay. a central ministry of education that creates the accreditation process for the universities. Now, and so as a result, I mean, everything is a regional accreditors and it's not through the, it's, and it's not the state doing the accreditation because uh, that just raises all kinds of problems. I see this all over the world is when the state is doing the accreditation of universities uh, it can cause, I mean, there's, there can be persecution as a result of it, or just even a reduction of your creativity. For example, there was this great, uh, the first Baptist university in Romania, they actually required a dual major, uh, Bible and whatever you're going to make your living at, because you couldn't make your living as a pastor in, in Romania. So you had to major in something else. Well, the Bologna Accords didn't allow them to do the double major because they had to adhere to those Bologna Accords. Now, they're still prospering, they're still doing well, but it made them change their curriculum. And so that's what happens when you get a state uh, accreditation. We still have regional creditors, they're still influential, they still could probably cause a lot of problems for Christian institutions around here, particularly on the West Coast. You know, Southern accreditation is a little easier. So yeah, those are the challenges that are gonna be faced. Uh, also, of course, money, and whenever the government supplies the loans for money, and the, whole government loan thing is a whole boondoggle. I mean, forgiving loans is one of the worst things you can do if you really want to help the poor. Uh, it targets the wrong people. I mean, they've run the numbers on this. I've written about this. It targets the wrong people. Um, it's really you're helping the middle class. You're helping the poor. You do that. But yeah, that's one of the other things. That's how the government will get out and control Christian institutions in the U.S. in the future. And so that will be a major challenge of how to work, be pragmatic about that and, and work through that. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there's a lot there that you're saying. Uh, how now? 
can, can I just switch a little bit to the Christian sure. Scholars Review? Uh, for those who don't know, I'm familiar with the periodical. Uh, what is Christian Scholars Review? And uh, do you enjoy being the editor? What kind of work is that? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, Christian Scholars Review, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. It's been around for 50 years, started by just a one professor at Gordon College who wanted to really help, you know, Christians think about how does faith relate to learning? What was that and, scholar's name at Gordon? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just blanking right now. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, probably, I, I can look online, <laughs> look back. Uh, my executive editor, I, it's, it's sad I'm not forgetting because he, he was fantastic in starting this by himself, right? It just shows how just this one little initiative, now it's actually sponsored by 45 Christian institutions uh, who help sponsor Christian Scholars Review. Um, and as a result, we're able to distribute it to all those institutions. Uh, and of course, it goes through regular academic libraries too. But also we have an online presence now. And that's what's been fun about being editor in chief is to try and do some new creative things uh, in some different formats. And one of the fun things we've started just in the past year and a half, uh, well, actually maybe it's more than that, um, is it's now two years now. Yeah, Christian Scholars Review blog, or actually I call it the Christ Animating Learning blog. And it's an interdisciplinary blog where we have contributors from all kinds of different disciplines write about how does Christ animate learning in their discipline. So, uh, you know, we have uh, economists, communications professors, business professors, um, sociologists, uh, philosophers, and uh, the whole range, you know, mu music professors writing about uh, different ways to think about different aspects of the discipline. In fact, one of our, you know, for example, one of our areas is sort of theology and sport. And we have all kinds of people contributing on, you know, how does theology relate to sport? And uh, it's really been, it's been fun to see it grow and uh, people become interested and it's gotten a lot of traction. So that's yeah, been an enjoyable part of it. That makes sense. Like for you to be, have that on your radar. <laughs> Baylor has a huge football program and other sports. Um, and oh, yeah. I guess you might want to think about at some point what the point of having all those sports is at a university. I mean, it's when you think about yeah. like um, Oxford, Oxford was started, what, in 1200, something like that? Right. 1200. Uh, was there an Oxford football team? <laughs> I don't know. Well, if they yeah, had no, of course, that's then. an American invention, at least the football part. But, you know, one of the fascinating things, I mean, you know, that is a good question, but you ask, you know, why you have music or performing arts in the university as well, right? There's a sense in which the university seeks to excellence in lots of spheres. And, you know, I mean, you said Baylor Athletics and Neil, and it brings up a couple of bad stories, you know, both a basketball player who murders another basketball player, and then also the Title IX scandal that we had at the university. But I'm I can not, probably- I'm not familiar with those stories. I, I'm just familiar with what the jersey looks like. Okay, well, we had a, 20 years ago when I first came to Baylor, we had a bas one of our basketball players murder another basketball player. And in the course of that, we found out that the basketball coach at that time was doing all sorts of illegal things. Um, he tried to cover them up because the, the, the light that got shown on that. And it was a huge scandal. We got- It was uh, related to the murder? Yes. The, the illegal the things? Was it drugs? What was it? Uh, well, he was, uh, had players that he was paying on the side that weren't supposed to be there. Okay. Uh, and some other things like that. And then of course we had a title IX scandal, which a lot of some sexual assaults from some athletes, particularly football players, um, that were not reported in the way they're supposed to be reported. And so that caused a big scene, but I will say one of the things that's happened at Bayer, and I give a lot of credit to our athletic director and also the coaches involved in sports is. They have turned those programs around. And I would say in our athletic program now, like Scott Drew, you know, who won the national championship a year ago and uh, goes to my church. I mean, Scott has. What, what was the sport? Sorry. Basketball. Basketball. Yeah. Shown uh, and I think been an example of what he calls creating a culture of joy, Jesus, others, and yourself. And he showed how you can do it at a major university. Um, in a significant way. And, and I think uh, I actually tell people now that at Baylor, one of the places you'll find the best Christ animating the learning is in the athletic department. 
you know, maybe obviously it's not consistent across every sport, but there's some really great leadership there who's, and they're doing some wonderful work. Wow. So are you actually paying attention to how virtue is, is inculcated in, in the sports programs there? Yeah, actually, I just, uh, I'll give a shout out to one of my students, Sean Strelo, who just finished his dissertation on how does Christ animate coaching at the D3 level is what he did a dissertation on. And yeah, that's a key subject for, for, the, for those coaches and for his dissertation, it was that, and it's a fascinating, he did some fascinating interviews about how these coaches are trying to figure out how do we, uh, you know, form athletes in a way that's Christ honoring, but also pursues excellence and, of course, a way that doesn't make it an idol. Um, and that's their challenge. And he's, he's writing about it and researching and proposing some, some ways to help strengthen that. Well, I have to admit that you just gave me something I haven't connected. I, I feel like I should have connected those dots before, but you know, th in this interview, I'm just now connecting them because I've always worried about sporting programs getting in the way of academics and, mm -hmm. and clouding the mission of the university. A lot of it as my own experience with athletes in my classroom Yeah, and, oh, understandably. and subtle I just worry about what athletes are taking away from the whole experience um, there. I have felt pressure to inflate grades of athletes. Um, I've felt pressure to inflate pretty much all of my students grades. I think there's a lot <laughs> of grade inflation. That's a huge problem. We, we really yeah. should talk about that, but, but especially with the, the, um, the athletes I've worried about, but, if you have a, a robust program of teaching virtue that goes along with the, it's really seamlessly integrated with the, the mission of the university to teach virtue, well, then athletics would be a great uh, oh, yeah. complement to that. It really would. In fact, as our, our football coach has said, I mean, he wants he actually encourages athletes. He says, don't think of football as a place you come out here and get your aggression. He says, football is an art and you are honing your craft. And right to hone your craft, you have to be excellent and, you know, have virtues to hone your craft. And that now granted, I mean, our football coach is a, was a philosophy major undergrad. So that tells you a little, he's, if you've ever seen him on TV, yeah. you know, people joke about him not smiling much. He's a real thinker type. But I think, you know, it's, it's great to see him do a different way of how maybe you do athletics uh, and football in particular, which is one of the hardest place to do it in basketball too. Um, and I'll say, you know, we, we've, I've seen that with our other coaches as well. Um, and I will say, you know, I'll say my experience at Baylor, I've never been pressured to hire a grade for an athlete. Um, now, granted, I, I'm teaching certain kinds of courses and things, and I don't have a ton of athletes, but yeah. Are you, do you teach undergrad? I used to, I don't anymore. I teach all graduate students now. So that makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah that makes a big difference. Yeah, it's, it's oftentimes subtle. Um, sometimes I wonder, is this just me? Am I just making this up? But. Oh, I, 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 I'm sure it happens. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've certainly heard and read stories about it. Happening. It's always very subtle. It's never, will you please give this grade? It, it's, it's more like, um, uh re some of the requests are are overt um but they're never for a higher grade over until they get the lower grade that they didn't want <laughs> but <laughs> but um yeah just uh, what i worry about is uh the um like if you have a participation component in a class and or maybe you have high stakes or low stakes high frequency quizzes like i give yeah. Uh, where uh, the whole point of a high, low frequency, high stakes would be to encourage something like attendance. Right. And then you have a schedule, a sporting schedule that uh, conflicts with maybe one or two of those really small quizzes. Um, if other students feel like the athletes are getting a pass, they don't have to be there for the quiz and they can make it up, but nobody else can make these pop quizzes. You know, it's stuff like that. Um, oh yeah. No, I, I think, I mean, treating athletes, uh, 
different, I mean, that was actually part of the problem with the Title IX issues at, at Baylor was athletes were treated separately instead of going through the tr some traditional disciplinary processes. For example, I was on honors. I mean, now the honors council did, did go through, but there's also another committee that actually I've been, I was on at one time for disciplinary reasons and they weren't going through that. So that's, uh, yeah, when you're trying, when you don't have everybody going through those same justice systems, that's a problem. And I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, what happened was on the honor council one time, one of the athletes who really should have gotten expelled, it went up to the top and the president uh, at the time, Ken Starr, he, uh, he overturned it. So sometimes you have to have uh, leadership that cares about those things too. Now I will say and start defense. Are you saying, I'm sorry, I might've missed it. Do you, are you saying that Ken Starr did something good or bad? Bad. He did something in over, bad. In, in overturning this um, on our council decision, which pro, which shouldn't have been overturned. It ended up later that student ended up doing one of the sexual assaults. Oh. So some, sometimes as there's a, a book called A Severe Mercy, I think Starr thought he was being Christian and being merciful. But sometimes we need to provide students with severe mercy, and that can be the best thing for them. That severe mercy book you're talking about, isn't that about a guy and his wife who became Christian at Oxford and they knew C.S. Yeah. Lewis? Yeah. Okay. I haven't finished reading it, so don't tell me the ending. Okay. I won't tell you the ending. Okay, good. Uh, I've met Ken Starr, and uh, I, I didn't have a... <laughs> very deep conversation with him, but I have met him. Um, and I'm not sure to me, I, I thought when I met him, I thought he seems like he's pretty well reasoned. I wonder what his reasoning would be in that case. I have some concerns about title nine stuff in general, the due process stuff. Yeah. That, I, I uh, share that concern. I, okay. the, when they, I share the, the, lack of, I mean, the initial when that letter went out and the lack of inclusion of due process. And I, and I was, uh, yeah, and I've raised that concern before and uh, they've yeah. now, they've addressed it and they've corrected it. However, it sounds like a new letter is going to be coming out that's actually going to be problematic again. But I think, yeah, now there's people who argue that you shouldn't have to do due process because it's not a criminal situation in higher ed, but I, I don't agree with that. I, I would agree with you that lack of due process is a problem. Yeah. Um, it seems like these investigative bodies take up a lot of energy and, and time that cut into other stuff that the university is supposed to be doing. Um, the due process concern I thought was pretty powerful because it seems like a lot of this stuff that's being investigated is criminal. Um, like for example, sexual assault is criminal. Right. And there's, there's a traditional pol police power of the state that exists to, to address uh, issues of criminality. Like that. Right. Uh, the police now, are typically the ones that, that investigate that stuff. But when you have bureaucrats on campus now taking time and resources of the university to especially when the the accused is from what i understand and we're talking about the obama guidance it was under the obama right. administration it was that a was letter the yeah it was a letter that was from the uh i think two down from the department of Education, the secretary i think it was the assistant secretary for civil rights or something like that right. wrote a letter it wasn't even it was not a rule. It was not formally no. made a rule by the rule making process uh, according to the Administrative Procedure Act. But no, but just no guidance. legal office in the university wants to counter that letter. Yeah. And then DeVos, Trump's uh, Republican right. um, Secretary, Secretary of Education, right. she rescinded that letter. Right. Now, and, and obviously, this is and a partisan and issue. Process protections. Yeah. That, to make due process a partisan issue, though, because it's nakedly partisan. I was on the campuses in 2016 during the election. And then shortly after in 2017, when DeVos was going up for confirmation, and I saw the reaction in Los Angeles to uh, both things, the election and DeVos, specifically DeVos, uh, I, 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 I had a hard time 
understanding how students and colleagues didn't take the time to address the due process issue that was a very substantive issue where the accused oftentimes didn't know what they were accused of, could not have counsel, right. could not have uh, confront the witnesses, which is right. a, you know, ordinary aspect of due process. Um, how do you defend yourself? It seems like this would just run rampant there. Anybody could complain about anything and, and you'd have all this university resources again, tied up in, in stuff that uh, doesn't really seem to promote any of these virtues, or would you say maybe push back if you want? Like, what is there? No, a virtue I, that is I, being... I agree with you on this. And in fact, you know, the courts, to be honest, the courts and judges, I agree. I mean, most, you know, a lot of universities have lost a bunch of cases and had to settle out of court, or they've had to settle out of court because they realized they didn't afford these due process protections. And it's been good to see some come around, uh, kind of what I would call more of a centrist group that emphasizes the need to retain these. But Again, uh, yeah, the current administration doesn't seem to have that same mentality, probably because it's pretty activist oriented and um, activists uh, tend to drive that kind of conversation. For those who are listening in the future and you're not following this little uh, little bit about what we're talking about, I think there's a funding issue. It's a funding issue, right? You don't get certain funding. Your funding will be cut off if you don't have these procedures in place. Well, uh, it could be a threat to receiving uh uh, for students being able to have government loans. And so and that, that can be an issue. Now, there's two institutions, Hillsdale and Grove City, that do not accept uh, government loans, so they don't have that problem. But every other institution in the U.S. that I'm aware of, that's maybe, maybe one or two, a few other exceptions. Okay, so that's the connection with Washington and like Baylor's campus would be a funding issue from student yeah. loans. So right. then the idea is, the Department of Education under Obama, they send a letter out, they say, hey, you should have these kind of, uh, it would be a good idea to have these kind of, um, what would you call them, tribunals or something? <laughs> Sounds like a dumb word, but. Yeah, that's a, that, but I think, I mean, this is, this is how you need to conduct Title IX investigations is basically what it tells you is, um, and I think, you know, I mean, I will say this from a Christian perspective, I think Christians should be very, you know, I think one of the things I've seen sometimes from certain kind of far rightish perspective is that there's not a concern expressed about, you know, victims of sexual assault. I think we need to be very careful about that. It happens. We need justice in those situations. We want it to be done right. Um, and I think that's the problem, I think where I mean, you and I are agreeing on is it needs to be done right. And that's, I think the big concern is that letter does not have it done right. It's a little more, um, I mean, due process is not particular. We had this, you know, hundreds of year tradition of protecting due process for everybody. And we need to make sure that that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, like, like when you serve on a jury, you know, they, they explain to you that, um, it's we would rather a guilty person go free than an innocent person suffer as if they were guilty but they're not and our system is built that way if if it has a flaw it's the flaw that the guilty sometimes go free because of the protections that are that have been taken so seriously this title nine thing, what that did was it flipped that exactly around and it said, well, if we're, we're going to have a flaw, the flaw will be that we catch all the guilty ones, but at the expense that some innocent people get caught up into it. That's how I interpreted it. I'm not even sure if it was as well thought out as what I just said. I'm not sure it was. It was just some assistant attorney, you know, not attorney general, it was assistant um, secretary of, of education that wrote this it was a letter it wasn't even guidance it wasn't even a, a rule it was just a letter and uh anyway i saw the crazy response i mean the, the, the hatred it was it was actually pure hatred it was actually hatred uh for betsy lavos uh devos sorry i got her name wrong on on this and i don't even know who i don't really knew who didn't know who she was i just know that the unions hated her they totally hated her and uh, probably had to do with all sorts of other stuff like school choice. She's been a supporter of school choice in Michigan. That's what it was. 
school choice. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. Do you have any views about school choice? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, I actually worked in public policy some years ago and, and argued on behalf of school choice. Um, I think uh, I think school choice is a matter of justice showing to different worldviews. And so I welcome the Supreme Court's decision today in which uh, in the case regarding the situation in Maine in which student, uh, parents were giving the funding uh, when they, students could not attend a high school that nearby, that there wasn't one, but the funding was restricted to secular schools and the uh, court overturned that. And I think that's good because I don't I think we shouldn't favor a secular worldview. We should allow justice and equality, particularly for those parents who are poor, uh, you know, inner, situ inner school, city situations. I think that's a major injustice. That's a really good point. Poor, poor people are the ones that suffer the brunt when the, the funding isn't tied to the student. Am right. I saying this right? Yeah. It's tied to the local district or whatever. And that district might be a failing school. That's really sad. It we is. should do everything it, it we can to turn those schools around. But sometimes the, the powers that be are in so entrenched, it's hard right. to know how to turn that school around. How do you do it? I don't know. But yeah, so I mean, in the meantime, it's easier to just, you're, you're talking about pragmatism, funnel that money because competition tends to, to uh, take an enervated thing. And all of a sudden there's energy <laughs> and you want, you got to rise to the occasion to, to, to compete. Yeah. How would you put it? No, I'd put, I'd put it that way too. I mean, I, I mean, I probably I'd lead with an argument for justice that I think it's unjust for uh, especially poor uh, religious parents, but um, I also think you're right. I mean, I think uh, situations. This is why I'm also a strong proponent of charter schools as well. And that, in fact, I remember seeing in a, you know an argument between one of the founders of the charter school movement and the union folks. I was there at it, and uh, the union person was talking about the danger of a particular charter school maybe going sideways. Well, the founder of the charter school movement says, "Well, actually, this school can then get shut down." Because that's how charter schools function. Whereas, you know, your regular public school cannot. It just keeps on going and keeps, you know, miseducating students. So I think anytime, I mean, parents want the best for their kids. I mean, and so they're going to, you know, do a lot. And if you give them that choice, they will, you know, search out for that choice. And I think that's uh, very important for school choice. Have you ever read a, a Thomas Sowell's book on? on uh, charter schools i think it's his last book that he wrote no i have it i probably my, my reading on charter schools is you know especially in the 90s when it first got started and uh, a lot of the research then charter schools are public schools right they are they're publicly funded um they're around a theme for example actually you may know uh jason bear when you were a colleague there at loyal marymount i know him yeah he has yeah he started charter schools there in southern california that focus on intellectual virtue and I think it's a great theme. I mean, it's been successful. And, yeah. you know, that's the kind of initiative that a charter school, uh, I mean, charter legislation allows that you can form schools even around virtues. Um, yeah, he has a book and, on virtue, intellectual virtue called the, mm -hmm. the uh, what's it called? The, um, I think it was just called intellectual virtues, wasn't it? I have it on my shelf right over here. I almost <laughs> said the righteous mind, but that's Jonathan yeah. Haidt. Um, yeah, that's it's uh, the uh, something mind. I forget. Yeah. It's a good book. It's Oxford University Press. Yes, it is. Um, 2012, I want to say. Yeah, I, I remember because it was he was my supervisor when it came out. He he was the okay. one that evaluated me at, at Loyola Marymount for ten for a long time. Yeah, I know him pretty well. We've had some very direct conversations about great inflation. <laughs> um, and and things like that and I, I was aware that he did start a charter school I, I I think we had a few conversations in the in the uh coffee room there at Loyola Marymount uh, about that uh in early mornings when he was there I always taught in the early mornings mm -hmm. um when the tenures don't the tenure people don't want to teach the early mornings, so I took them took those classes I love that Loyola and the Catholic tradition 
requires students to take philosophy, a rich, you know, philosophy of human nature, which is what I was teaching, ethics, upper level ethics. They were required, certain majors were required to take critical thinking. So I really appreciate that. Of course, I, I'm a graduate of Loyola Marymount as well, in bioethics. But um, so the charter school movement has a little bit more freedom in like putting forward a program like uh, that's focused on intellectual virtue, right? Yeah. Or, mean, yeah, basically a group of organizers can you know, set forth a particular vision and particular educational philosophy. And of course, this is true, true across the spectrum and uh, start a school um, and depending on the state, you know, the, what's the, what's the source of the freedom though? Do they don't have to deal with unions? I'm not sure what the source uh, of the union, freedom is. They don't have to deal with unions is often the case in most states. Now it will depend on the state charter law, but also too there, they are free from some, uh, certain kinds of the curricular re restrictions and reporting requirements as long. And what's nice about the charter schools, and I would say this is, I think what's important for even a school choice movement is they're evaluated on outcomes. Because that, that could be That's one stand, of the standardized tests, or what is that? It what's could the, be standardized it? tests, or it could, it's the outcomes of which they set forward. And what's good about that is, for example, you know, the Netherlands has a system of school choice, but often the government, sometimes with the government money in school choice, the religious schools get highly regulated. I one time had a student do a paper on uh, comparing Dutch schools, Dutch religious schools, and American. Uh, religious schools, Christian schools. And what she noted was their mission statements and the curriculum is so much different because the Americans had so much more freedom and the Dutch were much more controlled because of the, uh, because they were government funded through vouchers. Now it's different in Australia. Australia, the Christian schools there are evaluated on outcomes. And so the government does not put as much control over the curriculum. So as long as you're meeting the outcomes, you know, and they have a well-developed system of funding for religious schools in Australia. And who, the who, develops, schools, who develops those outcomes? Who says what they are? And that, you know, I mean, how high is the, is the uh, hurdle? And then who's setting it that high? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I don't know the exact mechanics in Australia regarding that. Um, my, my well, what about here be, though? Yeah. Uh, well, here, at a charter school, that would be in conjunction, right? The, the group organizing a charter school, for example, would set forth how they're gonna be evaluated and then they'd have to get approval. Um, so yeah, it's gonna vary just based on organization, but I, I'd say it's a lot better to have, if you have school choice in a situation where you're judging the outcomes instead of having the government control your curriculum or control other things is, is much more helpful. I guess that makes sense with the title or the the name charter school you have a charter the right. charter would set the the hurdle is that right or the outcome yeah that it's going for and then then at the state what the state does is there's an approval process for that charter there's got to be certain criteria yeah, about approval whether process for the charter and then there's also you, know, you have to meet certain things or else you can get shut down after a certain mm -hmm. number of years depending on it's it's five sometimes as they'll check or other states, you know, it's longer seven. How do they get their buildings and stuff? Like that's a long process of just, uh, you know, building. it varies by say, I've known charter schools. I mean, even here in Texas, you know, they rent an old shopping center. Uh, some have, have used churches, although you got to be careful. I mean, there's some issues there legally, but uh, yeah. So some, I mean, right. They get their buildings lots of ways. And that's one of the difficulties of charter schools is they face is those startup costs. And depending on the state, gotcha. you know, the state will maybe or maybe not fund those. Is there a private money in charter schools at all? Or is it just the state shoveling money and they're saying, okay, your, your charter's good, here's some money? It's, yeah, it's really even public schools can get private money, I mean, right? Public schools can uh, ask for grants. So charter schools ask for grants as well. And so that's possible to get grant funding for those charter schools. In terms of uh, your work at Christian Scholars Review, how much how much time does that take of yours from your duties there? Is that part of your duties there at Baylor, 
or is that extra that you have to do? It's it's kind of extra. Uh, it's I would say it's part of well, you'd say it's part of my service. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I don't get any anything from Baylor for it. Okay, um, so it's not like you have a, a clock and you clock those hours on your no. on your Black Baylor. Okay, do you get paid for your Christian Scholar Review duties? No, it's all work and love. Uh, it's all volunteer. Okay, I'm asking these questions because I feel like I knew the answer to that, but first of all, I wanted to know, and then secondly, maybe people listening they don't know, like mm -hmm. have no idea, like when you write for something like that, do the, does the author get paid? Does the editor get paid? But the, your author doesn't get paid, right? No, author doesn't get paid and the editor doesn't get paid either. So the, the way this works is if you have an institutional affiliation, you get a salary from the institution and there's some kind of expectation that you might be uh, required to, as a part of teaching, uh, to contribute to the discipline that you're in mm -hmm. and the wider conversation one way you could do that is submit an article get it reviewed and then published and that's all quote unquote for free in, in other words you're not it's not like you write for the washington post and they send you a check when they publish it because you sell to the washington post the copyright Right. I'm not sure how that works. A license, maybe, to use to use that material, but in this case, who retains copyright? Is it Christian Scholar Review or is it the individual? Um, if it's a, if it's in the journal, Christian Scholars Review retains the copyright. Although actually, I've I published there, and then you know they you just write Christian Scholars Review, and and we would give permission if you wanted to say reprint the article okay. in the book or edited collection. On our right. blog, actually, the author retains copyright. We don't we just don't mess with that. Interesting. Okay. So the copyright issue is interesting. So this is, so in other words, if you didn't have an institutional uh, affiliation and you were just an independent scholar, uh, that would be all on your own. You don't get, you wouldn't get paid to write for that. So Christian scholars review you now. No. Okay. So it's all out of the good nature of your heart. Yeah. I mean, really we're trying to, yeah, provide a space for for scholars to kind of try out ideas and uh, for the and to you know try out ideas in the public and distribute those and also of course to influence yeah. graduate students as well and hopefully the larger church. That's awesome. Uh, are you involved in the church at all? Yes, you have a I, local I church? Did First Woodway Baptist Church here in Waco. You go to a, a Baptist church, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you enjoy living in Texas? You know, I do, except for July and August, um, <laughs> and even June this month, this, this summer. But uh, yeah, I uh, I will say I moved from Colorado when I was in seventh grade to Texas. And that was my first time coming in. I thought, really? you know, yeah. when I got here, it was like we had the largest streak of 100 day, days over 100 we'd ever had. I thought, what kind of hell hole I, you know, dropped into. And of course, they made fun of my accent and uh, all the other sorts of things as well. But I will say I've come to love Texas for the people, just outstanding hospitality. Um, you know, I'll just give an example. My wife was in bed, uh, this is about 12, 13 years ago, uh, from the results of something called Guillain-Barre syndrome. She was in bed for a year. And our Sunday school class brought meals, not every day, but a number of times uh, for a year. And that's the kind of hospitality and Christian care that, I've wow. experienced here in Texas. And, That's awesome. Uh, there's just a lot of great, great people. And of course the food, the food's great as well. And, uh, yeah. and the, you know, the weather may not always be great, but you can always vacation in Colorado. What, what, <laughs> what, what's the gas prices there like right now? Oh, uh, four fifty, I think. Right now. Uh, it's getting up towards seven where I'm at. So yeah. we have more taxes. gas prices too. Yeah, that's why we got a lot of we have a lot of Californians in the, who are moving out here, especially in our area. Yeah, that's a shocker. A lot of the new people are citizen class from California too. So the the accent issue isn't is that starting to fade away then because there's so many foreigners coming into Texas? Um, no, there's still southern. I mean, it depends. Okay. You know, if, if someone's been born and raised in the South, yeah, uh, and their and their parents are southern. My kids have a little bit of one, but not as much. My wife, my wife's Canadian, actually. What part of Colorado did you 
come from? Uh, Denver, outside of Denver, Littleton, and then uh, Colorado Springs as well. I know Littleton very well because I am from Littleton. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, yeah went I, went Jefferson, I went to Jefferson County Public Schools. Oh, I went to Walt Whitman for elementary school. Walt Whitman. Where is that at? In Littleton? Yeah, it's off Cayley Avenue, off okay. Broadway. Is that a public school? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay, cool. It's closed now, but... Uh... Oh, okay. Well, I graduated from Chatfield High School, which is the major rival was Columbine High School. Everybody knows yeah. about Columbine. Um, now, I was a Columbine destroyer when I was a kid. You know, that was our soccer team. And I was a, you know, Columbine and Chatfield kind of a person. And um, I actually lived closer to Columbine than I did Chatfield. Chatfield was a newer school. And uh, so, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful area. It's very different than how I grew up already. Uh, it's changed a lot. I'm sure you've seen that. Oh, yeah. Every every time I go to Texas, though, I keep running into my exes, and I'm like, "You live here?" I had to get that joke in there at least once. You know, all my exes live in Texas, but um, <laughs> now that I got that, have you? Do you see rattlesnakes around? No, no. I mean, I mean, they are around. I mean, in fact, you know, I know some fields where people find them. But, uh, do you see yeah. owls, or do you hear owls around the campus? Yeah, yeah. You Actually, do? there's yeah, falcons and uh, and owls. In fact, I. Like there's a falcon around here. I'll see a nab a bird or a rabbit sometimes. Oh, nice. What kind of owls are there? And and are yeah, you talking about Baylor? Actually, not a big bird guy. Although it's funny, I went to I went to undergraduate Rice University and they're the rice owls, but uh, yeah, I don't know what kind of owls you call me. Sure, you can right. sure hear them. Though. Okay. Well, I'm a big fan of owls, and so if a university has owl sounds at night, I'm already a fan. I've seen owls. I've heard owls at Pepperdine. My students at Loyola say they see they see them and hear them. I never did. Um, I saw owls several times at Claremont Colleges where I did my study uh, on Pundamona College, on Claremont Graduate and uh, Scripps, I think one time. But Pomona has a lot of them. And I, I mean, I had several encounters with great horned owls they're awesome i love owls and then uh barn owls on some of the la campuses la city uh not la city but um la community college district where i taught so i love owls um perry is there anything else that you wanted to add that we did, did was there something we started to talk about and we got kind of we no i think back? i've covered it quite a bit so what's the answer Christian university can be a major university, a research university. Is that possible? Well, certainly it is right now in the United States. Uh, you know, I think there's a dozen Christian universities in the top 100. Um, most of them are Catholic, but you have Baylor and Pepperdine as well. Uh, so certainly it happens. Is it desirable to be a top research university and be Christian? Is that something that Christian universities should desire? Uh, I think certain ones with the resources and ability like Baylor and Pepperdine and uh, Notre Dame uh, should. Uh, they should try to be leaders. I think not every Christian university is, should be that. I think they have different callings, kind of like this, you know, different uh, parts of the body, of Christ's body. I, think I would say the same uh, for universities. Some should probably focus on, uh, you know, teaching undergrads. You know, there's like, for example, Christians have started to meet Christian college in India, but just tries to minister to untouchables. You know, obviously they're not concerned wow. with, either. you know, they're not concerned with being a tier one research university, but they're doing some, they're doing the Lord's work in an awesome way. Um, wow. What's so, the name of that school? You know, I can't tell you the name, actually. I just, uh, it, it, email it. If there's you can, actually, there's if actually you, 300 colleges in India, Christian colleges in India. So okay. I can't, I can't remember which one it was that does that. Yeah, that's interesting. That that's very thought provoking. Like what, what are we missing out if we try too hard to be really high in the rankings? What are we, what other things could we be doing? Is that kind of what well, you're going with? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is, you know, there used to be uh, Bible colleges were used to be huge around the United States. And I think they really appealed to a lot of blue collar workers who didn't have time to, you know, they don't want to get an extra education, but they want to get some Bible college. Those really have shrunk. I mean, they've largely disappeared. There used to be a lot of them in American Canada. Of course, even Biola 
if you know of, it used to be a Bible, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. But um, yeah, I think in some ways we've, uh, we've neglected our blue collar brethren in that area. And now granted, there's other ways to get that kind of education now, um, you know, whether it's online and, and who knows, maybe one could argue that Liberty and Grand Canyon University, the two largest Christian universities in the world of almost 100,000 students, most of those online, maybe they are taking that place um, uh, of those old Bible colleges in that respect. Um, I'd like to think so, but I also wonder if they're also uh, maybe not supplying as much Christian stuff online. And I've seen that where people just want to get people in so they water down the Christian aspect. So, yeah, I think there's room for lots of different kinds of Christian universities, and that's the beauty. And I see that countries that open up to private institutions and allow that diversity, I think really it helps them a lot. It's the common good as well. I come from a blue collar family. My dad was a carpet layer there in Colorado. So I have a, a heart for that. I also went to my undergrad. It was at Wayland Baptist University in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. In Hawaii. And and um, I was active duty in the military. And um, I had a white collar job, but I was enlisted. That's typically considered a blue collar type of idea, you know, even though I did a white collar job uh, for the well, I won't say the name of the agency, but there's an agency there. And uh, I had to go to school around my schedule. I was deploying. I deployed seven times. I still finished my undergraduate degree while I was active duty. It was re really hard, but I had to work around my uh, schedule for that. Is that what you mean by reaching blue collar people? Yep. Yeah. I think, I mean, providing those innovative ways and I think it's one of the beauties of the American system is we have, you know, lots of different types of institutions and true Christian institutions trying to meet people's needs in different ways. And so I, I do think, you know, that. certainly not every Christian institution needs to be an elite research university. Yeah. But that being said, actually, there are very few Protestant elite research universities. We probably need more of them in the world. Okay. To supply, because okay. they're the ones who supply the teachers. Yeah, that's true. And so well, I think we, there's more room at the table for that, or there's more need. I would say. Uh, something, something that's bothered me about uh, Pepperdine, which, which is, well, when I was reading the Malibu Miracle, which is a, a, a book by Bill Banowski, which is one of the early presidents of Pepperdine, the, the way they got that property in Malibu it used to be just a small, tiny Christian college in Los Angeles, and then they moved to Malibu. It was a Malibu Miracle. It was. Uh, but they they started branching out and, and eventually you see like Pepperdine and Irvine and Pepperdine and and uh, West Lake Village and <laughs> it's almost like they were the Roman Empire they were they were originally just a little thing and then they they want to be everywhere and do everything and sometimes I it just prompts the thought of well why can't you just be happy being a little Christian university perched on the ocean why do you have to be like rome you know, yeah. where you have to be everywhere you know you have to be in shanghai and you have to be in you know but uh i don't know i guess it's we, the nature we, we of probably, the organization i wouldn't say that at walmart right we wouldn't do that so because like the the cat yeah. australian catholic university is in all seven of the large cat is in all large seven australian cities and so there is a sort of hey if we have a good thing let's share it with everybody um and uh yeah, i wonder I'm not, how much of it is is trying to get money coming in though. right like for, because it's graduate programs that are doing this and and i, I don't know i mean I, I i don't know what i'm talking about i'm just saying what i notice and no i i think that's the tension i, I actually just did a study i mean yeah. probably out of this because i think our, my dinner is going to be coming up here but I just did a study on uh, graduate programs in, in the high level Christian Protestant uh, universities and colleges. And we found only a third of them really emphasized Christian distinctives. So I think for those other two thirds, those are largely money makers for them, right? You know, especially K through 12, you know, principal certification kinds of things, social work, credentials, all these things. And so the question is, are we doing our graduate programs and being Christian, not only in our undergrad, but also in our graduate programs, and particularly with the ones that get that kind of certification that people need? 
uh, I think that's a major challenge that Christian higher education faces in the future. Well, Perry, thanks. For, I, I lost track of time, I admit, because I enjoyed talking with you so much. We're so grateful that you came on and shared your wisdom, your life story, and your training and expertise with us. So thank you, Perry Glanzer. All right. Thank you.